Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laurie. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Banks for inviting me back, and the Molecular Frontiers Foundation, the Royal Academy, uh, and, and all the people who've helped to organize this, uh, this great uh, event. Um, so we, you know, we've heard a lot about um, questions. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things I like about science, and what I particularly love about this subject of how life got started is there are really a lot of questions, and they really they cover such a wide range of fields, from astronomy to geology to chemistry and biology, and uh, just getting to 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 talk to people from so many different fields and try to figure out how everything comes together is is, is really particularly fascinating, and I think um, in addition to this. Uh, approach to the world of always trying to ask uh, new and interesting questions. One of the great things about, about science, and I think it's really epitomized in, in this field, is, is the way it brings people together uh, to cooperate and collaborate and, and try to get answers to some of the mysteries of nature. And you know, When we see so many divisive and tragic things happening in the world, it's really wonderful that we're able to, uh, privileged to be able to work together. Uh, so, um, I thought I'd just say a couple of words about how I came to be interested in this, in this subject. Uh, uh, so, uh, as, as Laurie mentioned, in, in the 1990s, my, my lab spent uh, a lot of time learning how to evolve populations of molecules. And I think you'll hear more about that um, tomorrow from Jerry Joyce. And it, you know, it was a really uh, fascinating endeavor, and we were able to, to um, oh, thank you. Um, we were able to evolve new molecules that could do interesting things, catalyze reactions, bind to targets, uh, even lead to molecules that are. Um, are now in the clinic to treat diseases. But after doing that for roughly a, a decade, I became more and more fascinated by the question of how evolution actually got started spontaneously on the early Earth. I mean, it's one thing to direct evolution in the lab when you have enzymes and you know, all kinds of instruments and brilliant students, and, uh, but somehow, the process of Darwinian evolution really got started. And since I, I, my original background is in biology, to me, the origins of evolution and the origins of biology are really, really the same thing. So, um, so I started to focus more and more on, on, on those issues, and that's what I'll uh, try to talk about today. And what, what you see on this uh, opening slide is, is just a, 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 an illustration of what a really simple view of a primitive cell might, might look like now. I hope I don't... Yeah, okay. So it's a, a, a primitive kind of membrane enclosing some very short pieces of genetic material. We're not totally sure what that is, but we think it's probably something like RNA. And, and so we're trying to, to understand how structures like this came to exist on, on, the, early, on the early Earth, and, and we're able to grow and divide and, and start to evolve. Now, one of the things uh, uh, that's really, I think, rekindled interest in these questions, you know, people have been asking how we got here, you know, how life got started for a long time. But in recent um, years, in the last 10 or 20 years, there's been an explosion of interest in this because of work from astronomy. And we now know that there are millions, probably hundreds of millions of, of planets that are reasonably Earth-like in our galaxy alone. Um, and many of them could, in principle, we're pretty sure could support life. So this is just a, a sort of diagram of a, a, another solar system. Many of you probably heard of the TRAPPIST-1 system that's been worked on a lot by Didier Koulos at, uh, in, now in Cambridge. This, this solar system has at least seven planets, and three of them are in this, this green zone where there could be liquid water on the surface. So it's quite likely that planets like this actually could support life. But we don't know if they do. 
right? And it's going to be really hard to figure out. I mean, the entire field of astronomy has been revolutionized by uh, these kinds of discoveries, and everyone is trying as hard as they can to work out the technology to actually detect signs of life on, on other planets. So, in parallel with that, we can ask simple questions that we can address here in our laboratories and try to understand, you know, how, how could life start on these planets? How did it start on, on our planet? You know, if we understood the, the whole process, we could have uh, a, a better uh, judgment as to how easy or hard it is, how likely it is that there'll be life uh, out there. So, so there are a lot of questions in this whole pathway, everything from planet formation to, to early evolution. But these are some of the questions I wanted to focus on today, just in terms of how life actually gets started from the chemistry that's going on on a young planet. So we, we need to understand how the building blocks of biology are actually synthesized, right? So this is the whole field of prebiotic chemistry. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. This is not work from my lab. This is from, from uh, other, other laboratories. Once you have the right chemicals, how do, how do a bunch of chemicals get together and start acting like a living cell? Uh, and that's the topic that we've been focusing on. And then recently, things have advanced to the point that we, we think we can actually start to deduce something about the necessary environments. And, and this is bringing us into contact and discussions with uh, planetary scientists and geologists and atmospheric chemists to try to be as rigorous as we can in, in thinking about um, the right kinds of early planetary environments. Okay, so um, let's start off with, with uh, the chemistry. So uh, this is uh, a, a picture of... of um, uh, Stanley Miller's famous apparatus, in, in which uh, in 1952 he showed that using a spark discharge source of energy in what was then thought to be a realistic primitive atmosphere, uh, you could make all kinds of compounds, including amino acids, right? some of the quintessential building blocks of biology. And it, it was really a, a revolutionary advance uh, at the time. It generated a huge amount of optimism that the chemistry leading to life would soon be figured out. There was a lot of progress in the ensuing 10 or 20 years. And then, you know, things kind of stalled. And, and some of the problems started to become more evident. And in particular, if, if you really start to look at what's in this mixture of compounds, the closer you look, the more you see. There, there are thousands, probably tens of thousands, of different chemicals made in this kind of crude approach of, of just blasting an atmosphere with energy. And the, the materials that you want, a lot of them, are in there, but at very tiny levels. And some of the materials we know we need are not there. So how, how can we think in a more realistic way about generating the building blocks that we need to put cells together? And so I think this is really one of the transformations in the field. So I'm not going to give a lot of the technical details. I just want to try to give an impression of how the field has changed in the last 10 or 20 years and the new kinds of questions that we're able to answer. So, so this old idea of, of some kind of primordial soup that had everything in it floating around is, I think that's kind of a, now an old way of thinking. And what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how can we actually make chemical pathways realistic, right? If you have to go through step after step after step to get to something complicated like a, a, a nucleotide that you need to make RNA, it's not going to happen if you just mix everything together. And so there are new ideas like organic minerals, right? Building up reservoirs of intermediates so you can break a pathway into smaller chunks. There's a this kind of new term of systems chemistry, which means, you know, not just doing what classical chemistry does of taking two compounds and making them react to make a product that you want, but thinking about, you know, everything that could be around and, you know, what else can we use to make something work in a better way? And I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples. Okay. So one of the... Um, ideas that's actually been around, but which has really gained a lot of traction now, 
is that, somewhat ironically, life began from cyanide. Cyanide, uh, you know, not so great for us now, but it's a fantastic starting material. Uh, you can make a huge range of compounds from cyanide. How do you make cyanide? It actually, it's, it's pretty easy to make cyanide in the atmosphere. So different sources of energy reacting on a primitive atmosphere will all generate cyanide. And from cyanide, you can make apparently all the building blocks. The trouble is, how do you actually make use of cyanide that forms in the atmosphere? If it rains out into the ocean, it's basically lost. It's diluted, it will just hydrolyze and go back to starting materials. So, so here's a scenario <coughs> devised by my colleague John Sutherland uh, in the UK for how to sort of store up and save cyanide and then later on turn it into useful starting materials. So the idea is that if cyanide rains out into a pond or a lake on the surface, and that's in an area where there's um, geothermal circulation of the water through fractured rocks, water be circulating through rocks, heated by magma deep below, coming up through vents, and bringing up iron and other ions. And iron, ferrous iron, reacts very tightly with cyanide to make ferrous cyanide. Ferrous cyanide salts with some of these other ions will precipitate. So you can see building up layer after layer after layer of these cyanide salts over maybe thousands of years or, or even longer. So you go from having something that's very dilute that you can't really use to a huge reservoir of material that can subsequently be processed by heat, by water, to make useful starting materials. Okay, let me give you an example of uh, of systems chemistry, also coming from the Sutherland lab. So this compound here, uh, it's pretty simple. It doesn't look particularly bio biological, but it's very important. It's an intermediate on the way to building up nucleotides and RNA. And how do you make it? Two very simple starting materials, the simplest sugar, glycolaldehyde, and this cyanide derivative, cyanamide, if you just mix them together, and this was done a long time ago, not much interesting happens. You get a huge range of products, you get this polymeric materials, you get just a little bit of this compound that we'd like to have. What, what the Sutherland lab found is if you put phosphate in the reaction, phosphate is not part of the starting materials, it's not the product, but we think phosphate had to be around anyway because it's part of Nucleotides, it's part of RNA, there had to be phosphate there. It's a good buffer, uh, it can act as a catalyst, and when you have phosphate around, these two things react almost quantitatively to make this key intermediate. So that's an example of systems chemistry, of using things that aren't obvious, but that should be around that make things work better. And not only that, but this compound, 2 turns out is, is volatile. It, it will evaporate sublime at low temperatures, and then you can, you can crystallize it out on a cold surface. Another example of that kind of, you know, really simple physical way of purifying things is shown in the next step. So that intermediate reacts with another sugar and makes this compound, which is a little bit closer to nucleotides, and amazingly, it just crystallizes out of solution. So a lot of other products are made, but the one that we really want crystallizes out. You can imagine, again, this occurring on a geological scale, building up a, a large reservoir of this crystalline intermediate, a kind of you know, perfectly natural, plausible way of building up a reservoir of an intermediate uh, and then waiting at some point, the conditions change, the next step can happen, but you, you can process purified material. So these, these are the kinds of new ways of looking at, at the chemistry that, that have been making uh, it easier for us to understand how complicated intermediates like nucleotides could actually maybe form on the early Earth. Okay. All right, so what then? Suppose we have all these intermediates. We have amino acids and peptides and nucleotides. We have to get them together to start to make something like a cell. 
So this is a diagram of what we think that would have looked like. A very simple, stripped down uh, version of a cell. Again, a primitive cell membrane enclosing little fragments of something like RNA. And here the questions that we're asking are a little different. So how can we do growth and division, right? There hasn't been any evolution yet. There aren't any enzymes. There is no biological machinery. So there had to be just very simple chemical and physical processes that made everything work. And so the question is, how would this primitive membrane grow and divide? How would these little bits of genetic material get replicated without enzymes? And that's something we've been working on for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, and so I'll just give you a few highlights from that. These, these membranes that we're talking about are not as complicated as, as modern cell membranes, the membranes surrounding our cells. They're made of simpler uh, materials. They have very different properties. Uh, but the most amazing thing is the way they self-assemble. So you can take simple molecules, simple fatty acids like these molecules, kind of thing you find in soap, shake it up in water. They spontaneously make bilayer membranes, and they, they close up and make these incredibly beautiful structures like you see here, these vesicles, and there's vesicles within vesicles. So I want to show you uh, how simple structures like this can grow and divide in, with just simple physical processes. Now to show this, I want to show some movies, but we might, yeah, okay, this might work. I was a little worried about the lights, but this, this might be okay. What you're seeing here is one of these simple vesicles, simple fatty acid membrane. There's a fluorescent dye on the inside, so that's what we're actually seeing. We're going to watch it in the microscope when we add more food, food being more fatty acids. We expected this little vesicle, model of a primitive cell, to just kind of gradually get bigger, maybe elongated or something. What we didn't expect was what, what happened. You can see this little filament growing out of the vesicle. And this is speeded up, but over about half an hour, this filament grows, gets longer and thicker, and everything in the original vesicle gradually spreads out. And this process looks, in a way, very biological. There's a lot of movement and the shape changes. It's just soap and water, nothing fancy. One of the beautiful things about this mode of growth, so you can see there's been a huge increase in the surface area. The volume has only increased a little bit. These filaments are really fragile, and that makes division incredibly easy. Okay? So something that at the beginning we had no idea how we were going to make these things divide. Turned out, once we saw how they grow, it's really easy. So here's one of these filaments. It's, it's already um, grown. We look at it in the microscope slide, a little puff of air on the slide will come along and, and basically snap that filament in two. And then these two halves, when they sit around, they'll gradually round up and make two daughter vesicles. So that's a way to divide one vesicle into two daughter vesicles, just using very gentle shear forces. I just want to show you another way that division could work. Um, this involves a little bit more complicated chemistry. It's environments where there would be a lot of sulfur around. Uh, but again, you've seen a, a, seeing here a filament that has grown into, a vesicle has grown into a filament. It, it does this purling instability, and these little beads over time separate from each other and float away. So it's an amazing way to make lots of small daughter cells out of one initial cell. Again, it's just soap and water, um, nothing really fancy. But by combining these approaches, you can take... Um, a vesicle, grow it into a filament, divide it into multiple uh, daughters, grow, divide, grow, divide, and so on. You can keep doing this indefinitely. So in terms of a primitive cell membrane, we now have a cycle of growth and division. We have many ways now of doing growth and at least a couple of different ways of doing division. So that part of the cell-like uh, process of growth and division turns out to be incredibly simple and can be driven by by very um, gentle and common uh, physical forces. Okay, so what about the genetic material, right? It, it, if we want our primitive cells to be able to evolve, they have to have 
some, some way of having uh, new functions arise that have to be coded in some genetic material so these new functions can be passed on uh, from generation to generation. And we like the idea that RNA molecules played this early role. RNA does so many things in modern biology, and, and um, one of the most important is that it's actually RNA molecules that are responsible for synthesizing all the proteins in our bodies. Right? So we think that RNA was around right from the beginning, catalyzing simple reactions. But before there were enzymes, before there were enzymes that could make it replicate better, which you'll hear about a lot from Jerry Joyce tomorrow, there must have been, we think, chemistry that could have driven the copying of RNA sequences. And, and so how would that work? So I just want to show you a, 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 a simple uh, movie, an animation uh, made by Janet Iwasa to just show what we're trying to do. We, we think there were little bits of RNA floating around in a really rich chemical environment filled with activated building blocks, activated nucleotides. They can find their partners by base pairing, G with C, A with U, and just click into place, building up a complementary strand. Okay? So, so people have been thinking about this and working on this problem for a long time. This is not a new problem. Uh, much of the most important early work was done by the late Leslie Orgel and his students and colleagues, including Jerry. Um, so uh, I want to just start by, by uh, pointing out what I think is, is uh, Leslie's I think probably greatest single contribution out of, out of many, many. Uh, Leslie recognized that the materials, the chemicals in our bodies, in all modern life, that are used in DNA replication and in making RNA, these nucleoside triphosphates, they're great molecules if you have sophisticated enzymes. You have really good catalysts. They can use these molecules to do polymerization. But, but if there's no enzyme, these molecules don't really do much, except sit there and slowly hydrolyze. So at the beginning of life, these are probably not the appropriate kinds of building blocks. And so Leslie worked out that different kinds of chemistry, activation chemistry, would work much better. And this, these, this is an example of, of one of the best of, of those types of molecules that were uh, made in Leslie's lab. So this part of the, this pyrophosphate moiety up here has been replaced with this imidazole group. As a result, these molecules are much more reactive. They don't need an enzyme. They will start to polymerize and make RNA chains even without an enzyme. And they can be used to copy very simple sequences. So I'll give you, just show you one example uh, using this kind of much more reactive building block to copy a short bit of RNA. So the experiment I'm showing here, here's a, a little piece of RNA, um, six nucleotides long. It's base paired to a slightly longer piece of RNA. And what we want to do is copy these Cs by putting in this activated G building block. Gs should pair with Cs, and then they can get added to the primer, and the primer can get longer in this direction. And so what you see is, in this time course, we start off down here with just this primer, this nu six nucleotide bit. After a minute, you see the first nucleotide being added. The first G has been added. A few minutes later, the second one. A few minutes after that, you see the third. Right? So this is like amazing chemistry. There's, there's no enzyme, but we're, we're copying this RNA template. OK, so, so that's the good news about this chemistry. The bad news is that that's really the only reaction that works really well. And if we try to copy a sequence that has all four nucleotides in it, it basically doesn't work. Right? We put in all four activated building blocks and let them sit around and nothing happens. All right, so, so the question is, you know, are we thinking about this in the wrong way? Is there some missing chemistry? Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have time to go through a lot of really interesting advances. I'm just going to cut to um, 
an advance from the last year or so in my lab. And basically, uh, over 30 years of thinking about and working on this problem, we realized that if we change what was a carbon atom here to a nitrogen atom and make this new leaving group, things work much better, right? So it gives you an idea of the pace of progress in this field. It's sometimes a little slow. Um, but nonetheless, we're getting there bit by bit. And so these molecules are nice because they're, on the one hand, more stable. They hang around longer but they react much better in this copying chemistry. And so now, again, we have in green here an RNA primer. We want to extend it with these nucleotides in red by copying this part of a template. And what you can see is we start off with this, just the primer. Over half an hour, you can already see new bases being added. And after 18 hours, we've completely copied seven nucleotides, and some a bit more. So, you know, we, we need to make this work even better. We have a lot of ideas about how to um, copy longer sequences. We think if we could get up to copying templates that were 20 to 30 nucleotides long, that might be good enough to get evolutionary processes going. We know we can make RNAs that are catalysts by assembling little little chunks that are 20, 30 nucleotides long. And, and so that's the goal. So I want to just say something, though, about this, this new uh, activating group, this 2-amino imidazole. The question, of course, is, you know, is this just something clever that, was, that works in the lab? Or does it have anything to do with the origin of life? Right? Would molecules like that have been around um, in the early chemistry? And we think this time that we might have something that's really relevant. And I think the way to explain it is shown here. So this is a molecule I mentioned right at the beginning. It's 2-amino oxazole. Goes on to build nucleotides, okay? From chemistry that's really well worked out in the Sutherland lab. Here's our new uh, molecule that we're using to activate nucleotides so that they'll polymerize. It's only one atom different. We've changed oxygen to nitrogen. And it turns out you can make this in the same reaction that you make this just by adding ammonia. And then, amazingly, there's another molecule very similar to aminothiazole. Change the oxygen to a sulfur, you make this. So again, you can make it in the same reaction mix just by adding the right kind of sulfur. And this will will act to store and accumulate other intermediates in the process. So these, these three really closely related molecules, all made in simple chemistry from simple starting materials, all potentially made in the same or very similar environments, can go on and do play different roles in building up RNA molecules. So what do we think this primitive genetic material really looked like? You know, I kept saying we think it's RNA or something like RNA. I think from everything that we've learned about making variants of RNA, we, th we think the primordial material was more or less the same chemistry of RNA, but a kind of messier version and with some small changes. We think the, the backbone's ne not necessarily always linked up in the same way. Um, these different kinds of linkages can form, and they're not harmful. We used to think these were terrible, but it turns out they're not. Uh, we think there could be some small chemical changes in some of the nucleotides, like putting a sulfur here makes everything work much better. And, and this is actually still seen in biology in part of the uh, protein synthesis apparatus. There could be some other small changes, um, uh, but it's close enough to RNA that you can see how it could evolve step by step and give us um, the modern version of RNA. Okay, so, so what are we really missing then from, from, all this, um, from all this chemistry? There's been a huge amount of progress. We know how to make, we think, from the Sutherland lab, how to make the pyrimidine nucleotides, U and C. We still don't really know how to make the purines. Um, there's a paper that's recently come out uh, from Matt Pounder's lab, who used to work with John Sutherland, used to work with me, he's now got his own lab. He's figured out this beautiful chemical pathway where you can make 
an intermediate and process it in one way to make UNC and process it in another way to make some of the purines. Not exactly the natural modern purines yet, but something close. We, we still don't know how to get the phosphate onto nucleosides in the right way. It's interesting that in a lot of this chemistry, the phosphate ends up in the wrong position. So there's something missing there, right? We need to figure out how to get phosphate on in the right way. So that's something a lot of people are working on. And then what are the sources of chemical energy, right? We, we can drive all these reactions in the lab, but we don't, we don't have the right source of chemical energy to understand how this could have happened in a primitive early Earth environment. We have lots of ways of doing that for peptides. For example, this volcanic uh, gas, carbonyl sulfide, is a great activating agent. If you bubble carbonyl sulfide through amino acids, you'll make peptides and, and do lots of other interesting chemistry as well. So we're looking for something kind of analogous to that to, to, um, to activate nucleotides and get them ready for copying chemistry. Okay. So those are some of the questions people are asking, and we're also now trying to think about what environments on the early Earth could have supported all this chemistry. What environments could have nurtured very primitive cells and driven their growth, and, and, and growth division and evolution? Okay, so we want environments where organic compounds can accumulate. We don't want them to fall into the ocean and get diluted and lost. We want them to be in surface lakes or ponds. This is a picture of Yellowstone Lake in the western US. Um, you can imagine if this was on the early Earth that organic materials could get concentrated here uh, and, and build up uh, over long periods of time. Uh, I said we're looking for sources of chemical energy. We like environments that are kind of cool most of the time, like this, because RNA is a delicate molecule. Right? You don't want to cook RNA for hours or days. It'll just totally degrade. So we want an environment that, that's pretty cool, but we do think that you might need um, short periods of high temperature so that once you've copied a template, made a double helix, got the strands apart to copy them again. And these geothermally active areas can do that. So we'd like these hydrothermal um, systems. So, so volcanic systems are an example. So in Yellowstone Lake, you see these, these, these vent structures that emit plumes of hot water. Uh, and, and so you can imagine primitive cells being caught up in these and heated quickly and then cooled back down. Another environment that can do this, this that's uh, got this kind of geothermal activity, is um, uh, crater lakes, impact craters. So the early Earth, of course, was bombarded a lot by, by um, um, large uh, you know, asteroids and comets that would create large crater lakes. It's another environment that we think could uh, have played a role in nurturing the beginnings of life. And, and this is just a diagram of, of how we think that would have worked, how the environment could have essentially controlled and driven the whole processes of growth, uh, division, and replication. So cold most of the time, so cells living in this cold water with all a rich environment full of uh, other building blocks, it could have RNA copying going on and growth of the membrane. Every now and then they get swept up in a plume of hot water, serves to separate the strands of the RNA duplex, also allows for a, a rush of nutrients to the inside of the cell and then you can go through another uh, round of growth. So this is a way that the environment could drive uh, a primitive cell cycle. Okay, so that's that's kind of an overview of where we are on, in our thinking about how, how life got started on the early Earth. Um, but uh, thinking about that kind of problem also raises uh, other interesting questions. So in everything I've talked about so far, we've been trying to think of you know, the chemistry and the physical processes that would give rise to life as we know it, right? modern biology. But then you start to realize, well, maybe there's other ways of doing things, right? Could we think of designing kinds of life where the biochemistry is different? And I think that's a really interesting and a huge challenge for the field of chemistry. 
Uh, and so I just wanted to point out um, a few examples, both from my lab and other labs, of, of how this might be approached. And again, we're thinking about it from the process of membranes, which can be made from non-biological building blocks, and genetic materials, again, that can be made from a non-biological chemistry. So, so here's an example of uh, membrane chemistry from uh, Neil Deverai's lab at UCSD. Uh, and what Neil has done is to take advantage of, of this very widely used um, copper click chemistry, where an azide and an alkyne can be joined together with the copper catalyst. And so here you're making a molecule. It's got two carbon chains, uh, a charged head group. It looks close to our biological phospholipids, but it's chemically a little bit different, and it's made in a very different way. But these things make membranes, and in fact, the catalyst that does this can also catalyze its own replication. So these membrane systems can grow indefinitely as long as you feed them building blocks. So this is a, a potential route into making a, a non-biological membrane system that could grow and divide. Uh, one of the molecules related to RNA that we've been working on in my lab for quite a while is shown here. It's called 3' NPDNA, or phosphoramidate DNA. It's, it's very close to DNA, except that this oxygen atom's been changed to nitrogen. And that has the advantage that in the building block, the nucleotide, this hydroxyl's been changed to an amine, so it's much more reactive. So these molecules are actually easier to copy. The copying chemistry is just uh, much faster and easier than with RNA. And we're not there yet, but again, when we can at least imagine the possibility of building living cells from a genetic material that's different from RNA and DNA. Okay, so these things are pretty close to biology. Can we go further afield? Can we imagine making kinds of living systems where the chemistry is really completely different? And a lot of this thinking was stimulated when um, uh, the um, Cassini Huygens mission discovered these lakes on Saturn's moon Titan. These are not lakes of water, they're lakes of liquid methane and ethane. And that made a lot of people start wondering, you know, can you imagine anything living in an environment like this? Now, liquid methane is kind of hard to work with. It's not a very pleasant thing to work with in the lab. But we can work with organic solvents. We do that routinely. And, and in fact, here are some vesicles formed in decane. This is from uh, the Kunieda lab uh, in Japan from uh, quite a long time ago, uh, more than 20 years ago. But these are the kind of inside-out membranes. The, the polar parts are in the middle. The hydrophobic parts stick out into the hydrophobic solvent, and they make vesicles. They look like completely normal vesicles, but they're just inside out, and the chemistry is totally different. What kind of genetic material can you imagine in a solvent like this, right? And so we're, I just at the moment have one person in my lab working on this. Uh, it's at a very early stage, um, but it's a, it's a really fascinating Project. So, so here's, here's what uh, we're trying to make. This is work from Kyle Strom. Y you can see it's, it's kind of a, a double-stranded uh, polymer. And um, if you look closely, you'll see that the nitrogen's either on this side or on this side. So in terms of building blocks, it's an, it's an aldehyde and an amine. So instead of um, base pairing by hydrogen bonds, here we have a reversible covalent linkage. Uh, we only have two kinds of building blocks at the moment, um, but we can start to see replication chemistry happening in systems like this. It's not easy. Working on things like this, one of the wonderful things about it is it makes you appreciate RNA and DNA even more. You realize how totally amazing uh, DNA is and how hard it is to design something different that has the same properties. But that's one of the things that makes it so fun uh, to work on. So, um, so just to, to summarize, I've tried to, to give you a, a kind of overview of, of new ideas and new questions in the chemistry leading to, to life on the early Earth. 
and, and just point out the, some of the tantalizing beginnings, which I think, if people keep working on this, will in the coming years lead to the ability to make living systems that are chemically completely different. And I think that's going to be really fascinating. So uh, I didn't do any of this work. It's all fantastic students, brilliant postdocs, um, and collaborations with labs in, in many different fields. So um, thanks again for inviting me back, and thanks for listening.